Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the to the second part uh, of our presentation. Um, we call from suspicion to detection. I'm, I'm really, really glad to see so many of you joining in again. Um, makes us really happy. So today is again is the second part of uh, a two part presentation. Um, last time on Tuesday, I, I guess many of you have been there. Uh, by the way, I hope my audio is good from the, from the very beginning today. If not, please let me know. <laughs> Um, so, so today the goal would be to, to, to draw conclusions from, from the data collected in previous steps. If, if you remember on Tuesday, we were talking about processes which are running on the system, uh, network status, um, user activity. We talked about timelines quite a bit. And today we're going to try to go one or two steps further and do some analysis examples. Um, I, I'm going to have plenty of uh, tools uh, which I show you and a number of uh, websites. Um, please remember, you don't have to take any notes. The, the slides will be made available um, after this uh, session and as will be the video will be recorded on, on YouTube. So you don't have to take any notes. Um, and the uh, reference section of, of my presentation and of all the other presentations contain lots and lots of links which you can uh, take further. Um, so again, drawing conclusions from what we did earlier, uh, please remember this is something uh, Klaus has been talking about last week. Um, it's, it's quite important this, to repeat this every now and then. The, the data, which is probably from a compromised system, may be forged. So you may be looking at things which are not the real stuff. Um, it may be incomplete. So you may, during the investigation, there may be situations where you think, oh, I have to go back and collect more data, which is not a problem. But Keep that in mind. So everything really is hearsay uh, at this point in time, and and that's that's one of my main points. Um, the results will always have a certain degree of uncertainness. So um, I've had this a number of times. Not that, that not that often, to be honest. But I, I've had a few investigations where even after spending weeks of analyzing a system, I just didn't find anything. And you always are uncertain. What did I do wrong? Did I did I miss anything important? But at one point in time, you have to stop and say, okay, I didn't find anything. But you, you can, nevertheless, you cannot conclude that the system is clean, that it has not been hacked, that there's no malware on it, just because you didn't find anything. Just, just keep that in mind. This, this may happen from time to time. Okay. So these are the things we want to look at today. A couple of examples, of course, the timeline, since this is one of my main and favorite topics, uh, actually. Uh, we have to talk about the Windows registry, even, even though most people don't like it, and even though many of you will probably only deal with Linux or Unix systems. But the, the registry is very important in terms of uh, investigations. And of course, we will look at network traffic and uh, one of those uh, buzzwords from the last couple of years, uh, the term threat intelligence. Let's, let's look into this as well. Okay, off we go with timeline analysis. Um, again, I've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, we, we, we uh, on, on Tuesday we had a number of different ways to create timelines from from very simple ones to what we call a super timeline, which contains lots and lots of timestamps, not only from file times uh, timestamps, but only from uh, but metadata as well. So why why timelines in the first place? And um, that's because the, the the events are not that important, but the uh, the relationship between you and so when, when looking at the timeline and that's the, the second quote here which which i really really like um think of the timeline as as about the outline to a story so when, when you look at timelines and when you do this frequently you would quite quite often find a story what what really happened on the system and that, that's why you do it and in my experience uh in, in most of the, the um forensic um analysis I did, uh, there, there, there was a certain point in time where something happened, for example, an antivirus alert, or you got alerted from external, that, that something is suspicious on your systems. So we have a certain point in time where, where, you, can, where you can just look very closely to. So it's, um, that's most of the time where, where we do forensic in the first place. So, so for example, you have an, an AV alert about an infection and you will want to know what happened on the system just prior to the alert. So for example, you may see a suspect URL was accessed uh, from your proxy logs, for example, and then uh, on the system on an investigation, a directory was created and an ex executable file was dropped straight away. A Windows registry was created and, and stuff like that. You, you get the idea, that's, that's why I want to look uh, at the timeline 
in the first place. And let's go back to this very simple timeline. I showed you on Tuesday a number of times. It's not a super timeline, it just, it just contains timestamps from the file system. Uh, but we get a lot of interesting things just by looking at this. And so let's do this right now. First of all, we do, we do have timestamps which are quite close together, just a few minutes uh, from the first to the last, and it's only seven or eight timestamps anyway. Uh, we do have a number of uh, executables here and then the user bin located, which have all been accessed. This is the A time, if you recall it. And if you remember, um, this can also mean uh, an executable was run at that point in time because it had, has to be opened and accessed. That's why the access timestamp is set. Then we have uh, something which looks suspicious because it's probably a directory which has been created, the end time, the modification time. And then we see uh, an, an, uh, a file or at least uh, the metadata because it says it is, it is deleted. So let, let's let's try to create a story here. So it may, it may be that we have an attacker here who is uh, on the system who's logged in. And first of all, he runs the uh, W command to see who else is logged in. He may be interested as an, as an administrator uh, or other users uh, and that could uh, be problematic. Then he used curl probably to download something to the system. He wanted something on the system was, which wasn't there. Then he used the bzip2 uh, to maybe extract the thing he has downloaded just prior, a couple of seconds prior. And then he used shred to delete or overwrite the file. And if we, if we look down here, um, it may be that the attacker used curl to download OpenSSH from whatever location. We don't see this in the timeline. He, he used uh, curl to download OpenSSH. Then he used bzip2 to extract the archive, which we, which we see here. And then afterwards he shredded, so he deleted it, which tells us the time as well. So that, that, that's what I mean when I say that, that we have a story here. It's a very simple one, but we have a story here. And, and it's, although it's only seven or eight timestamps, we, we immediately have, have a feeling of, of uh, what was going on, okay? So let's let's look at some of the challenges. When when you do time analysis uh, quite frequently, there's there's some of the things you you just need to keep in mind. First of all, don't forget it's it's quite easy to forget you're only seeing the last timestamp. So if if we go back for for a second, um, like like the access time, this is the last time the user bin W was accessed. We don't see the things that happened before that because this is the last time the access timestamp was set. It's very easy to forget. Sometimes you don't see any access times at all. Um, and if you if you if you're into file systems, you probably know that Linux file systems may be mounted with the no A time option. Then that, that timestamp is never set. So you, that's um, something you need to know during the analysis. And uh, there's something similar in, uh, on Windows. There's a registry key which is called NTFS disable last access update. This may have been set, and actually that was the default from Windows XP and Vista uh, until fairly recently. So if you don't see any access times, uh, just check whether the setting uh, was active at that time. Um, and then we do have some really nitty gritty details. Uh, this may be not relevant in, in all the analysis you run, but uh, it's, it's good to know these things and to, to look at the documentation every now and then. For example, from when we look at Windows systems, uh, and I've been looking at Windows systems quite a lot. That's that's why I put this uh, into here. Uh, it says us the, the NTFS file system, which is the file system uh, in, uh, under Windows, uh, stores values, uh, time values, and UTC format, which is good for us. This is something I prefer. So that they are not affected by changes in time zone or daylight saving. Um, the FAT file system, on the other hand, which you still encounter every now and then, uh, stores based uh, on the local time of the computer. So when you run an analysis, you always have to kind of translate what you see to your to the real time. You know that that's just uh, something you have to keep in mind. Or if you look at the resolution, the uh, the, the create time on FAT file systems is ten milliseconds from from the res uh, resolution uh, point in time. Uh, the write time has a re resolution of two seconds, so it's completely different. Don't ask me why. And the access time even has a resolution of one day. So it's a really access date, not the time. You know, this is this is details you just need to know uh, every now and then. Whereas the NTF, NTFS file system, for example, 
delays update to the last access time for up to one hour. One hour can be can be interesting when we run timeline analysis. Again, this may not be really super relevant during most of your analysis, but it's it's something you need to keep in mind uh, if you if things really don't uh, if really look weird after you do the timeline analysis. And this has especially implications when you run when you run a super timeline which contains a, a timestamps from multiple systems. You, you may have an NTFS timestamps in there and FAT file system timestamps in the same timeline, and so you need to really look very closely. These are, by the way, all quotes from something from, from Microsoft. So this is all well documented, which is good. Um, some of the other challenges you will find during an investigation, you will find lots and lots of timestamps in different formats. Even, even if you analyze Windows systems, Windows has lots and lots of different uh, representations of timestamps. They even use uh, Unix timestamps within Windows at certain places. So you just need to know these things. So, so for example, if you look at all these timestamps, which are listed here, these are all identical. So would, would you recognize that? Or would, would the tool recognize it? Probably not every tool, but let's, let's hope for it. You know, let's just keep that in mind. Can be, can be challenging during, during analysis. analysis. Sometimes you, you don't really see the timestamp because you just don't know that's there. For example, this is a Twitter URL. Um, and there's actually, there, there is a timestamp in there, which many people probably don't know because it's not that well documented. It's not really super uh, relevant for most cases, but um, here's a timestamp. Um, fortunately, there for everything, there's a tool out there that's free and uh, um, publicly available. In this case, it's, it's a tool called Unfurl. Uh, it comes with a, with a command line interface like the screenshot here. Uh, there's also a web-based interface, and it tells us that the, the, the number you see here actually is, is a timestamp. So that's, that's the time uh, stamp where uh, this tweet uh, this uh, thing was tweeted tweeted at, at uh, Twitter. So you just need to know this, okay? Some other, other caveats um, which you may run into, time zones and daylight saving. We've talked a lot about this before, but it's surprisingly easy to, to forget. Um, for example, we at DFN said we very often get, get warned from external sources from other thirds around the world. And sometimes they only tell us, well, we have a suspicious um, IP from you detected on our system at uh, 12 noon. Um, and you, sometimes you keep forgetting, okay, what time zone are they in? What does it mean for us when I have to investigate something? Um, keep that in mind. And uh, the other thing is that most of the tools out there, even the ones we looked at on Tuesday, have different uh, precision uh, when, when dealing with time zone. For example, this, this loose grid we looked at, the TSK, only has a uh, precision of, of seconds. They don't lock into microseconds or milliseconds like Plaza and Lock to Timeline do. Um, so that's probably not that relevant in most of the analysis, but keep that in mind um, that maybe it may be relevant. We do have clock drifts and time shifts, um, but usually not a big, big deal anymore because most machines uh, uh, synchronize with, with time service nowadays. And of course, timestamp can, can be manipulated, but to be honest, I've not seen this that often in, in the cases I was running uh, over the years. And sometimes you, um, you detect time manipulation very easily. And uh, so uh, the original timestamp may be lost, but you can see that it was manipulated just from looking at the timeline. So that's that's why I asked is, is are these points really relevant? Uh, and in most analysis, I, I don't think so. But the other point uh, at, the, at the very uh, bottom here uh, can become uh, a problem during investigation. And that is, especially when you run uh, super timelines, it can easily consist of millions and millions of entries. So it's, sometimes it's really hard to, to, um, to find the, the, the details. And sometimes you don't even know at the very beginning what timelines, uh, what timestamps are interesting in our investigation. Okay. Uh, but the good thing is, um, or not, not the good thing, but um, I'd like to, to present you a tool here, which, uh, which I um, really like a lot. Um, when we look at timelines, or when we looked at timelines uh, up until now, it was, well, huge ASCII files that you uh, wade through. Uh, but of course, many people prefer uh, user interfaces or stuff like that. And there's a, there's a very cool tool I really recommend, uh, which is called TimeSketch. Um, time sketch is actually it's developed by by Google 
uh, but it's um, on GitHub, so it's uh, um, open source and freely available. And it, it allows you to uh, to run queries and um, things like that on, on on super timelines and go to the, get to the results much more quickly than by waiting through, by looking at it in a text editor, for example. And the, the, the great thing is um, uh, they have also representations like this one. You can, you can uh, have graphs, which are, by the way, very good uh, when you have to report uh, when you have to write a report during the investigation. So this is we're not going into the details here, but you see uh, someone logging into a host and logging into the next host. We have an anonymous login here. So uh, sometimes these graphical representations are just much better than uh, looking or making uh, screenshots from, from ASCII files or from, from, from editor uh, stuff. And one other good thing, uh, thing about time sketch is that uh, it allows uh, multiple investigators to, to, to work on a current case. So when you have uh, bigger cases uh, and, and lots and lots is going on, uh, you will probably not be the only analyst. Um, um, uh, this, this is a, quite a complicated graph, but uh, it, it, it tells you that there's um, uh, there's multiple uh, analysts working together on one case, and time sketch allows for that, which, which is which is good. Okay, moving on. Um, as I said, I, I have to quickly. Um, talk about the, the, the Windows registry. Most people don't like the registry, but every foreign indicator loves the Windows registry because it contains just so many, many, many useful artifacts, um, even timestamps. So the, the, every registry key carries a last written timestamp, uh, which is uh, super important and in many investigations I do uh, because we, we do a lot of malware analysis and stuff and most malicious software samples will, will, will do something with the registry. So uh, what we, for example, what we see is we, we see more and more fileless uh, malware. So the, the, the malware itself gets, never gets written to disk as a, as a binary. Um, but some of the uh, malware you know, families out there store itself in the registry. For example, uh, there, there's a quite um, a big malware family with, that was active last year and this year in, in Germany, for example, called GoodKit. Uh, they store the, the DLLs uh, inside the registry, and, but never in the file system. Um, so this is this is quite an interesting artifact. Uh, some some malware samples or families store its configuration or encryption keys in the registry, and this has been true for for many many years. You know, most um, malware samples set some of the order run keys which are there uh, to survive reboot. So that's a, a persistence mechanism. And if you combine that with another uh, thing, uh, which is prevalent in uh, Windows, the volume shadow copies, um, then you really can travel back in time during, during uh, an investigation. Uh, for those of you who don't know volume shadow copies, um, they have been around forever. They, they used to be called system restore points in, in very early Windows versions. And what happens basically is that the, the operating system from time to time makes a snapshot of, of the system configuration and of other things uh, just in case the, the, the system crashes. So you can always go back and add us to a previous uh, point where the system was running uh, normally. And the volume shadow copies, as it's called today, also um, copy uh, almost a complete registry. So you can travel back in time and see when a registry was first written. So when it first um, shows up in the registry, although it's a last write, written timestamp, uh, so you can really build a story here and see when a system was infected, for example. Volume shader copies may be turned off though. You can just, if you don't need it, you can turn it off. Um, and so keep that in mind. If you, if you analyze the system and you don't find volume shader copies, they may just be turned off and they will vanish after some time. Uh, Windows will uh, eventually delete the, the, the very old volume shadow, co shadow copies. So uh, you cannot travel back eternally. And well, analyzing the registry is cumbersome because there are so many potentially interesting uh, registry keys and registry locations. Um, so it's hard to remember all those or, or even to know all those registry locations. But the good thing is there are, of course, there are tools out there uh, which can help us in, in analyzing the registry uh, quite a bit. Um, 
two of these tools are Rec Rippy and Rec Ripper, which are very closely related. They have basically the same, the same functionality. So Rec Rippy, this, this is from the website from, on GitHub, is, is a framework for reading and extracting useful forensics data from Windows registry hides. Um, Rec Ripper has been around for, for, for many, many years. It's, uh, it's basically, it's a Perl script um, and you feed it the registry files. And Rec Ripy is just a uh, more current uh, development. It was developed by our colleagues at Airbus CERT um, and it's uh, written in Python. So I don't know if you prefer Perl or Python, they're both basically the same from, from in terms of functionality. But they work on raw extracted registry files. So it's not supposed to be run on, on a live Windows system, but you have to extract these files somehow. So you may have heard of files like ntuser.dat or SAM and run uh, the, 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 the software afterwards. Both, both Rec Ripy and Rec Ripper come with lots and lots of plugins. And those plugins uh, query the registry for the uh, quote unquote interesting uh, registry hikes. So again, you don't have to remember those yourself. Uh, and, but you can also, also uh, always uh, write your own plugins. So for example, there's, there's a plugin called run.py, uh, uh, which uh, looks in the registry uh, for artifacts that show us that certain software has been run on the system. And there's quite a, quite a few artifacts there or URLs that have been typed in by the users on the system or the recently opened uh, office documents, for example. It's a very simple um, framework and the output is uh, in a text report, which we can then use um, to, to look for uh, further. So here's a command line, very, very simple example. Uh, you, you tell RedGrip that you want the verbose mode and uh, the, the, the evidence is stored at this location. So this has been extracted to uh, in, um, a directory which you control, and you want all user hives to be checked for the type URLs. So, so very simple. You can you can of course run multiple plugins at a time, or all the plugins. This is just one example, and it tells you well the administrator. Uh, I could not even open the key, so probably he has not he has never uh, opened a URL as admin. And there's a user called John who has one entry here. So okay, so you you get the idea of what it looks like, and. Rec Ripper has a very simple wrapper uh, around those Perl script. Um, um, you can just tell him rip, and he then uh, um, rips the registry for the example uh, example registry hikes. And again, the output is, is it's a text file. Like here, you, you see the user was created on that file. I don't know if it's uh, suspicious or not, uh, but you, you get the idea of, of how these tools uh, actually work. Okay, speaking about auto run locations for a second. If you've uh, working, uh, been working with Windows, you know there's, there's quite of these famous or well known auto run locations like current version run or run once on Windows. Um, again, many malware samples use these keys to, uh, to, to, for persistence reasons, but do you know how many auto run locations there actually are on a modern Windows system? It's not only 12 or 25 or stuff, it's actually more than 100. So <laughs> again, do you know all these locations? Probably not, but there, again, there's tools out there that will help you in, um, in analyzing this. And there's, there's a very nice, if you're interested in this, especially this topic, you know, there's, a, there's a very interesting uh, blog by a guy called Adam, um, who, who started a few years ago uh, to, to really analyze Windows systems for, for persistence locations. So, he calls this beyond good old run key, started out with, with part one and the, the, the most recent entry is from May this year. And he's at number at part 134. So it's some of these uh, are not really that common, but uh, you get the idea is there's so many locations to look for just in terms of auto run locations on a Windows machine, okay. Okay, next topic, traffic analysis. Um, the challenge when, when, you, when you have a network related incident, of course, is how do we distinguish regular traffic from suspicious or the malicious traffic? And I cannot give you an answer in this talk because <laughs> you have to answer this yourself, actually. Uh, you need some kind of base, baselining in your organization. So what does normal traffic look like? We need to know that in order to be able to 
see this is suspicious traffic or this is not normal. And this baseline has, of course, to be adapted every now and then. Um, goals of network analysis or traffic analysis are, for example, try to detect scans. So very often we see um, a port scan, of course, um, but even in your internal network, you may have, the attacker may have um, attacked a system already, and now he's scanning the internal network for, for other um, possibly interesting systems and machines. He might enumerate systems just for for the sake of um, finding out uh, how your infrastructure looked like, what what might be the next the next hop to to attack. Uh, you you may want to to, to detect probes. Like sometimes they, they do, don't do port scans on it. They, they just do server version probes. For example, to detect a web server which has not the most current patch level and therefore is vulnerable to, to an attack or password probes, SSH password probes, for example. Lateral movement is something uh, which is uh, very interesting because often attackers use uh, attack systems which are not that well protected as a stepping stone to attack the next system which maybe have a relation and do you see in your organization do you, do you see the traffic connections between systems that typically do not communicate with each other do you know this would you recognize this? or they communicate at, at unusual times and um, probably the most um, uh, um, the biggest threat we've been having for the last two or three years is ransomware, where data has been exfiltrated. So it's not only encrypted uh, to, to get some ransom from you, but it's also been exfiltrated to, to put you under pressure. If you don't pay the ransom, uh, we will publish your data and it's ha it happens every single day. Would you detect this data exfiltration? So we, we do have network indicators, of course, at, at different levels. Um, first of all, what most people are used to is packet captures or PCAPs. Many of you, or maybe all of you will know uh, Wireshark or TCP dump. Uh, this, this can be very interesting because uh, packet captures can contain URLs that were accessed, a payload, so, so uh, binaries that are being downloaded or other things that are being downloaded can contain username and passwords. Uh, but you, you don't do this as a broad measure, and it's, it's probably not legal anyway, but um, PCAPs you usually work with as a, when you really have a specific investigation objective. So it's not something you do all the time. Um, what you probably do all the time is looking at your network flows or net flows. These, these are some levels up the packet captures. Um, it usually network flows are used to gain some, some kind of general picture of what is going on in the network. So statistics, metadata, but it can also be very useful to detect suspicious traffic or suspicious things that happen in a network. Um, it never contained pay, packet payload data. So it's, it's really only, uh, we have a connection from system A to system B at a certain point in time. Um, very often network flows are, are sampled because just of the sheer volume. So you don't see every packet, but maybe every hundredth or every, every thousandth packet only. So it, it may therefore not contain all the activities of an attacker, but it will give you a, a, a very good overview um, anyway, for example, we at DFN so, uh, we look at network flows to detect uh, machines that connect to known command and control servers. And as soon as we see a, a machine connecting to um, a command and control server, and it's not only a single packet, but we see more and more packets, we, uh, we can warn our constituents that here's a, a system which communicates with command and control server, please have a look at it, okay? Uh, then, of course, you have logs from firewalls, switches, routers. These all belong uh, to the analysis um, as well, but we're not going to talk about this today. And then there's things like network caps. From time to time, when you really have a, 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 a very interesting case, you, you may be able or may be uh, forced even to, uh, to collect all the, uh, the traffic uh, from a router or a switch. Uh, but again, this is not something you would probably decide, but your, your higher level management will have to decide this because, um, um, yeah, it's, it can be critical. Okay, looking at Wireshark for a second. Um, this is a statement from their website. It's the world's foremost and widely used network protocol analyzer. And if, I guess most of you, maybe even all of you will know Wireshark, will have worked with it. 
So it lets you see what's happening on your network at a microscopic level. And that's actually really true. It is a de facto standard. I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So it's a free protocol analyzer. Again, everything's free, we will tell you here. And you cannot only display packet captures, PCAPs, but it can also record it. So when you have a system under investigation and it's still connected to the network and you think that there's a malware communicating, you can just use Wireshark and record the traffic. It's extremely widely in use and very powerful. And it's very customizable too, which uh, that's actually why I will uh, talk about this uh, for a second. So this is a screenshot you all know when you work with Wireshark. This is from their website. It's a couple of years old, but these things haven't really changed. Uh, apparently, they someone had a, uh, a problem watching Netflix uh, on the system, and so this is just a, a screenshot from a packet capture we see here: uh, UDP and, um, DNS query and DNS response. Uh, so these are the uh, these are the connections that uh, are in this packet capture. We see some metadata below here, um, and the, the the actual payload of the of the packet of the DNS response in this case. Um, um, we we see down here. Um, oh, well, by the way, for those of you who uh, use Wireshark a lot, there has been a new version released only very recently, um, and they made some uh, significant changes to the display filters up here. So if you use filters a lot, uh, have a look at the uh, change log uh, from their most recent release because things have slightly changed. Um, so what uh, what I really like about Wireshark is that you you can customize the the, the display layout a lot, um, and that's actually why, why I'm talking about this right now. For example, I never use the the, the first column here, the, the the number. I'm just not interested in that, and I don't know if anyone is. Um, I also don't like the time display at this point. I would read. I would rather read um, uh, another format, especially UTC or something like that. And you can do this. Uh, personally, I, I never use the protocol. I just know, don't care. I'm much more interested in source and IP uh, port numbers. You can find those here, of course, but uh, uh, I like another dis uh, uh, display. And and actually, it's way down here. I hope you can see this. Um, um, there's a URL to a blog post where a, a quite um, well-known malware researcher called Brad Duncan has a very interesting and long blog post on how to how to modify the the, the layer of of, um, of Wireshark to see things just much quicker. And this is, for example, this is almost an extreme example. We we do have timestamps which are readable, uh, so it's in UTC, um, and we have destination IP and ports. So he, so in this case, is not not even the source IP and source port is included, but that's just his workflow. Uh, but by looking at the PCAP here, it's from again from two weeks ago. Uh, it's again about Emotet because Emotet is uh, um, something we have to work with uh, or deal with every day. And you immediately see just from this screenshot, we have uh, the system uh, downloading a, a DLL from a, um, from a certain URL. Then the uh, Emotet C2 traffic starts to, um, uh, starts to begin. And down here, the, the, the system, which is infected, uh, starts spamming itself. So just from this screenshot. And, uh, it would have taken much longer on, on this screenshot to, to, to see this. Okay, so I really recommend if, you, if you're a Wireshark user, have a look at this blog post. Um, I made some changes after I read this to, to my Wireshark. Um, and the good thing, uh, you can have multiple profiles for, uh, uh, for example, for malware analysis, uh, your, your display might look different than for other things, okay? And for those who don't know Wireshark, at, at, at every point in time, you can just right click on one of these sessions uh, to get more detail. So for example, in this case, the DLL was downloaded as we see right down here. So this is client communication, this is server communication. And if we right click down here, the spam bot traffic, quite clearly we can see the, the SMTP uh, connection happening here. Okay. If you prefer the command line, I'm not going to into detail here. Of course, the command line is very valuable as well, especially when you when you um, put those things into into scripts to automate things. You, you you don't always want to use the graphical user interface. Sometimes much quicker for you, for for, for you, um, especially when you combine those things with you know, you know you name it, grab org tail and stuff. And if you're good in regular expressions, you get to the results very very quickly. 
So how are we doing time-wise? Okay, um, but have you, have you heard of a tool called Explico? So Wireshark, again, is, is a protocol analyzer. It's very, very powerful, but it may be, it may be uh, too powerful for, for, for your needs. And, and Explico, this is, again, this is from the website. What Explico does, it takes a PCAP and then it extracts from the PCAP all the applications data, which is contained in the PCAP. For example, it um, extracts emails, HTTP stuff, FTP, TFTP, and so on. So it's not a network protocol analyzer like Wireshark. It's not as full-fledged, but it's an, it's, they call it an open source network forensic analysis tool. And it's in all those uh, tools, uh, tool, uh, forensic tool collections like Kane and, and Deft, and it's, it's pre-installed. So you might have a look at it. It may be more fitting for you than Wireshark, but I'm unsure as to if it's still actively maintained on the, the last activity on GitHub is two and a half years old. So. But it's working. So just just a couple of screenshots. What what Explico does? It just it's a very simple user interface. In this case, it just displays all the URLs it, it finds um, in a PCAP, and you can click on every single URL. For example, the first one is uh, Google IT dot IT, and then it gives you the details. So so you get the the, the idea. And during an analysis, this may be more fitting for for you as as an analyst. Okay, so have a look if you're interested. And the same for emails, it extracts all the emails so you can quickly see what's going on. And if you click on an email, um, it gets you the details. Okay, and NetFlow uh, um, again is a powerful feature as well during analysis. Although you don't get the payloads, you don't get really connection details, but it tells you, you cannot really see this, I'm, I'm sorry. But uh, it tells you, for example, the top 10 uh, source IP addresses or the top 10 flows uh, that were seen in the last X days or weeks or stuff like that. And, and you can immediately see if you use a graphical unit, uh, user interface outliers like this one. So this is probably something has happened at this point in time. So let, let us investigate. So that's, that's one of the strengths of, of NetFlows. Really, really, really useful, uh, I think. Uh, okay, well, one more thing. Uh, this is uh, this is actually sometimes you, you you look at log files and network network log files and see things like you cannot really explain and you probably need to Google what's going on. This, this is obviously DNS requests going out there. So, but the, the weird thing is, first of all, the um, the null pointer is being asked. It's not the uh, the null records. I'm sorry. It's not A records or triple A or MX records being asked, but it's the null records. This is unusual. And then we have, I mean, we have a domain here, example.xyz, but all this stuff here, what, what, what's going on? It's actually data exfiltration. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this here is because I want to, uh, for those of you who are interested in these things, I want to rec uh, recommend um, the, the ENISA trainings. Uh, Klaus has talked about this a bit in, in the first talk. ENISA has a lot of freely available trainings on incident response and forensics. Uh, and this actually, the introduction to network forensics is the most recent one, I think, from August 2019. And it's not only a document, way more than 200 pages, um, uh, it also uh, contains a number of exercises. So you can download some virtual machines and play around with this. And this is actually a screenshot from that, um, from that document. So it's, I think it's really useful. But I wouldn't have recognized DNS uh, data exfiltration uh, without looking at this document, to be honest. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, threat intelligence, that's that's a term. It has been around forever, uh, even uh, um, especially outside the, uh, the digital world, threat intelligence actually from the, from the military world. But it has been a, a kind of buzzword in, in our uh, world for, for quite some time now. And um, IOC, so indicators of compromise very closely related to each other. And so let's let's talk about this for a second. Um, uh, I like the definition made by the NCSC in the UK. Um, just read it here. As with traditional intelligence, a core definition is that threat intelligence is information that can aid decisions with the aim of preventing an attack or decreasing the time to take to discover an attack. Um, yeah, let's just leave it there. And there's actually four subtypes. The first two subtypes would probably never, you would probably never encounter during your day-to-day -day work. First of all, you have something they call strategic threat intelligence. 
it's highly uh, uh, doesn't contain any any technical details, so it will probably be uh, consumed by senior decision makers. So it's probably something like a report, for example, indicating that someone is believed to hack into foreign companies. You know, you know, so it's not something really useful for you as an administrator, but it's there. Then we have things like operational threat intelligence. This is about specific impeding attacks, for example. Um, yeah, attack groups and their infrastructure. And again, this is usually only only governments or, or large organizations. Uh, um, yeah, will have the, the knowledge, so it's not really of interest to you. Of interest to you is uh, what we call threat uh, technical threat intelligence, and this is actually indicators of compromise. Indicators of compromise can be things like IP addresses of C C two servers, hash sums. Uh, you may you may find uh, malware on the system, network artifacts, stuff like that. So this is actually the, the technical threat intelligence. Um, fairly easy to consume, ha often has a very short lifetime. Uh, so for example, um, command and control servers, of course, they, they change their IP addresses. Not not that frequently, not that frequently for most uh, malware families, but some do very often change. Uh, sometimes uh, within minutes or seconds. Um, the same for, for hash of, of malicious files. Uh, what we've seen a lot recently is that uh, um, attackers deliver uh, uh, malware which contains the same functionalities, but uh, they, they do something we call hash busting. So they make slight changes that just change one or two bits um, in the malware and you get a completely different hash sum. But anyway, it's something you can search for. Um, and that's why we're talking about this here. And all these indicators of compromise usually are consumed automatically. For example, you, you, you have feeds uh, from threat intelligence vendors and you feed them into your IDS, into your Zeem and whatever, or into your MIST if you do uh, threat sharing, if you have a MIST platform running, uh, that is uh, where you would be looking for indicators of compromise. So during uh, investigations like we will be talking about today and on Tuesday, these are uh, the indicators we we are most mostly interested in, and then we have things like tactical threat intelligence. Um, that is something a bit more complicated, often referred to as TTP, so tactic, techniques, and procedures. And this is actually uh, yeah information about how threat actors are actually conducting the attacks. So it's 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 more the, the bigger picture. It's not about single indicators of compromise. So but it's more. Um, what tools do the attackers use? What, what, uh, do they exploit vulnerabilities? Uh, how do they do lateral movement once they're inside the organization? Um, so uh, I really like the pyramid down here uh, from a um, well-known security researcher called David Bianco, who says the, the TTPs actually are really, really tough. Um, so again, the, the IOCs we found find down here, this is uh, probably that uh, the things that we will do be doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis when, when analyzing systems. So let's get one step further. So maybe you, you found you found during the investigation, you found that malware sample somewhere in the in the in the file system, you found a file that shouldn't shouldn't be there, or you saw C2 communication in a in a PCAP. Um, and want to investigate further. What, what, what do we do with it? What do we do with IP address or with, with the malware sample? And fortunately, there's there's so many uh, useful search engines out there uh, to search for um, to search for ISCs and to get a picture on what is really going on. Obviously, you can always use Google or your favorite search engine. Uh, but two of the tools I really use a lot and uh, will present. Uh, in the next couple of minutes is virus total and everything from from abuse to th and but even twitter uh, is a useful source and we will be looking at that as well so let's let's first have a look at virus total for a minute uh, i think many of you know virus total and have known virus total for quite some time um, they started up um, as yeah you can you, you could upload a file and they scan the file with i don't know Today, 50 or 60 or even 70 antivirus solutions, and you get the result. You can you can also um, submit URLs and check uh, if, if these are suspicious. But virus total, um, other than just uploading things, is also a very very powerful for search engine, and that's why we're talking about this today. I mean, you can you can just search for URLs or IP addresses, 
or domains or file hashes. So again, let's let's assume you you found a malicious file. You don't have to upload it to virus total in order to get information. You can just uh, upload the, the 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 hash sum, the MD5, SHA1, whatever, and see what virus total has for you. Um, but in, uh, when it comes to uploading a file, uh, one word of warning. Um, what many people don't realize, and many people don't know, everything you upload to virus total will be shared with others. So uh, don't share anything uh, which shouldn't be shared. Uh, they, they even write this here, down here, please do not submit any personal information or up here, automatically share them with the security community. So many people don't know this and, and sometimes upload things that shouldn't be there. Uh, for example, I see very frequently, I see uh, complete emails being uploaded, whereas uh, the attachment would have been sufficient. For example, malicious uh, Excel or Word document attached because emails contain usernames, IP addresses, you, you name it. So just just a word of warning: don't upload any everything to to virus total. It will be shared. Okay, so let, let's look. Um, maybe you found you found a malware on, on the system. Um, I've, by the way, I've, I've included the the, the SHA six two fifty six sum down here. So when you uh, want to play around with this and come to the similar results just copy this uh, um, this uh, hash sum after downloading the slides and, and check what you found with virus total so the first thing many people uh, use in virus total is of course the av detection and we see here uh, lots and lots of uh, antivirus scanners uh, detect something it's not really useful cryptic msl inject but you may be not interested in the detection at this point but you see there are so many virus scanners alerting on this sample we just checked. Uh, it is definitely malicious. Okay, so this doesn't help to tell you what kind of malware, but it tells you a lot already. Uh, the thing which many people don't know, but which I really, really like is the relations tab up here. So let's look at what the relations tab show you. And the, first of all, it, it tells me uh, this very sample we are just looking at has contacted this URL. So this is a, a further indicator of compromise, which might be useful for you. So you can maybe have a look at your proxy logs and see if you see communication to the system, which is here as well, um, or to this um, um, URL. This is, by the way, um, very uh, easily detectable as a malware family called LokiBot, uh, but that's not of interest right now. It also tells you which IP addresses were contacted by this malware sample. I can again you can use this uh, information to look in your firewall logs for example so this is this is really threat intelligence which is useful and you have not really uploaded anything to any platform you just searched for this uh, for this malware sample they, they even tell you that this malware sample has been uh, um, has been dropped by opening uh, an excel document so again, this is something you could you could use uh, in your investigation. Maybe you find this Excel document on your system as well. So from from this screenshot alone, you you, you have a lot of um, further indicators of compromise, which may be useful for your investigation. Okay. And where does uh, virus total uh, have uh, come to these results? And that's uh, if you click on the behavior tab up here. Um, because what, what virus total does it does not only scan all the files you upload it also runs those files through multiple sandboxes network uh, malware sandboxes like the vmray based here in germany microsoft sys internals they have internal uh, malware sandboxes and all the results you see here uh, will be put into the uh, relations tab on a, a um, dense level a condensed level sorry so for me, it's a, it's a really, really, really useful resource. I use it every day. Um, but you can also, again, you can use for uh, search for IP addresses, for domain names. For example, another very loose, useful feature is that uh, VirusTotal also does passive DNS. So if you if you search for a, a host name, VirusTotal tells you this host name has resolved to these IP addresses over the last couple of days. Again, very useful information, which may be useful for you in your, I don't know, firewall logs stuff like that okay moving on abuse.ch um, probably many of you have heard of this as well this is a research project at uh, university of bern in switzerland uh, it's the home of a 
couple of projects that are <laughs> helping internet service providers and network operators. Um, what many people don't know, this is actually run by a single person. Um, and it's not even his, his, uh, his, his job. Uh, so it's even more powerful. Um, and they provide regular updated feeds and block lists. So you can use lots of these things. Everything is free, by the way. You can use lots of these data uh, to feed it in, into your Zeem IDS, into your firewall rules or threat intelligence platform. Um, the four main projects they have is the URL house. This is a database of uh, malicious URLs. So when where uh, malicious stuff is hosted and being downloaded from uh, usually hacked uh, hacked servers, then there's a thing called uh, malware bazaar where, where you can um, uh, get more details about uh, specific malware samples. For example, the one uh, we we searched in virus total earlier, we can search here as well. The auto tracker is actually a um, um, list of block lists. So this is um, regularly updated, and you can use those block lists to to automatically feed or look into your into your log files. And ThreatFox is a more general uh, IOC search engine, which has been uh, added to this portfolio only only very very recently. It's, it's, so it's very useful. All of these things are very very useful. Um, I use it every day. So here, a couple of very simple screenshots. For example, this is a screenshot from Theodo Tracker. Um, it tells you these, these IP addresses are actually command and control servers. But in, in contrast to, for example, um, virus total, it also tells you the malware family. I don't know if you can read it here. It's a, it's a bit small, I'm afraid. It tells you it's, it's Emotet. Um, virus total doesn't tell you it's Emotet. Maybe the virus scanners tell you, but virus total doesn't. And it even tells you the, the, the IP address is currently online. So you may want to look in your log files if you have an affected system. Um, and these are updated every few minutes, uh, which is really, really useful. Um, then we have Malware Bazaar. Uh, again, this is a search engine where you can just put your the, the SHA, the, the hash sum you found on your system and, and look um, what Malware Bazaar tells you. And this, uh, uh, case it's a quark bot sample, which is a very, uh, uh, I would say, popular malware family as well. And the good thing is about malware bazaar, for example, is it has an integration with lots and lots of external threat intelligence feeds, and like virus total, like VMRay, uh, so you get lots and lots of information. Again, everything is for free and uh, very very useful search engines. So uh, you will get um, a bigger picture when just by looking at these things. But as I said, even Twitter is, is a very useful resource. I know many people hate Twitter, uh, but when it comes to IOCs, there, there are so many security researchers out there who use Twitter uh, to, to, uh, to post their findings, and they do so very, very quickly. So whenever you find an IP address which is suspicious, go and check if someone on Twitter has seen this as well. You know, like here, IP addresses, um, hash some from Emo, Emotet, domains, very, very useful. I do this a lot. And you don't need a Twitter account for, for that. You can just search these things. OK, we're almost how we're doing time-wise. Oh, yeah. So um, yeah, these are the, the virus total and abuse.ch. Again, these are threat intelligence platforms, which are very useful. Um, so wrapping up um, the, the, the two talks from, from Tuesday and, and today, there's many, many tools out there, many, many awesome free tools. So check out these, these URLs especially. So you, usually there's no need to develop your own tools. Um, you probably don't have the time anyway. Um, but if you do this not only once a year, twice a year, check out, as, as we've said before, um, those dedicated forensic distributions like Kane or Dev or from, from Suns, the uh, SIFT workstation. This is actually a screenshot. I know you cannot really read this. Uh, it's, it's too small, I'm afraid. Uh, but this is a screenshot from, from Kane. Uh, it contains lots and lots of useful, useful tools for incident response and forensics. So put this on the thumb drive uh, and, you're, and you're good to go uh, uh, in the next uh, incident, hopefully. <laughs> OK, wrapping up. Um, Live response often is, is good enough for us. We don't always need a real full-blown forensic investigation. So what we 
what we looked at during the uh, last two presentations is often good enough for you to get results and to, to clean up afterwards. Many attackers simply aren't that clever and you, you don't really find very often the attacker who deletes their traces without you noticing it. So, and even if the intruder tries to remove traces, they might miss something, which is still good enough for you. And your initial triage will not destroy. That's, that's what I uh, said at one of my very first slides on Tuesday. Uh, don't be over anxious. Uh, you will not destroy all the artifacts that are, also, uh, that are there. The world timelines, <laughs> yeah, this, I like them a lot. Um, they've become more and more important. And I can't remember the last investigation I did where I didn't make a timeline and at the early step. So I like it a lot. It's a very powerful tool from my point of view. Um, there's no such thing as point and click forensics. So uh, even those um, forensic distributions I, I told you is, is not that you, <laughs> it's a button start forensic investigation and you come back three hours later and have the results. This doesn't happen. There are many tools out there, but you, you need to know the tools and the limitations. Um, but you will get to this when you do this every now and then. And by the way, this is even true for the, there's, there's three, uh, worldwide, there's three um, forensic, uh, uh, commercial forensic suites, which are very, very expensive. And even, even those tools, you, you know, you need to know the tools in order to get useful results. So sadly, we could only scratch the surface. I know this. We could have talked lots and lots more. We just had to pick a few um, things which we thought would be of interest to you, and I hope you learn a little bit. And uh, I hope you come back to the next webinar. So um, it's a real incident. It's time to acquire the evidence, and uh, this will be presented by Klaus uh, next week. Actually, I think we're it's twelve o'clock. Looks good. Um, Thank you very much, uh, very much, everyone, for, for attending. Um, really glad that so many of you showed up again. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. Um, obviously, we're running a little bit um, yes, beyond time. But that, no, that, that's absolutely fine. I think um, quality of content is, is well worth it. No one really notices the time when there's good quality content. Um, I'm getting lots and lots of um, thank yous and stuff like this. Are there any questions coming through on the chat that I can see? I can't see any questions at the moment. Lots of lots of applause, um, lots of thank yous. So I think, yes, the recordings will be supplied. We will have those recorded and so forth. So yeah, absolutely, not a problem at all. Um, I think we can probably call that a, a, a day. And um, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, really enthralling again. And um, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you for taking part in the poll. And uh, we'll be sharing the. Oh, two people have raised their hands. Hold on a second. I can't see. Let me just see. Can you change your hands. Uh, nope. No, I can't see who's raised their hands at the moment. I'm afraid I've got 225 people to scan through. Um, yes, it, yes, the slides will be available. Yes, absolutely. And um, I'll, we will see you all on the on the ninth. Thank you so much, everybody.